Welcome to Maximize Your Influence, your resource for the top persuasion, influence, and negotiation techniques that will help you maximize your success in life and business. And now, here are your hosts, Kurt Mortensen and Steve Olson. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Maximize Your Influence. I'm Steve Olson. I've got Kurt Mortensen here with me. We are headed full steam into the Christmas holiday. I hope you're all enjoying this time of year and the fun stuff and all the the traffic (laughs) and everything that goes with it. Kurt, I can't go anywhere. So all the roads are jam-packed. Everybody's decided they just got to go out right now. I thought everyone was doing this online shopping thing. What's up with that? I don't know. They got all the roadways jammed up. It's, it's traffic to eat or traffic to shop or traffic to have traffic or traffic because you're supposed to have traffic or because you're supposed to go places because it's Christmas time. I don't know. But it's everywhere. They I all don't... feel obligated to go somewhere. It was. I was in San Diego and there was still traffic. But at least it was warm. <laughs> at least it was warm. Yeah, that's right. We <laughs> complained on the last episode about how cold it's been, everybody. And it's gotten a little bit better, although the eastern U.S. is still getting pummeled with all those storms that came across the west and the Rocky Mountains. So good luck out there, everybody. Drive safe and have a happy holiday. But in the meantime, we've got some information that we want to cover with you all today. That's the reason that you tune in and you put up with our weather and food talk and football talk. At least most of you do. (laughs) If you're not (laughs) listening, you no longer put up with it. (laughs) (laughs) Done with it. We went too far. But, Kurt. I wanted to get into a pretty interesting article that I read on Psychology Today, today, and I thought it was pretty relevant because, you know, this time of year, everybody's getting in touch with their loved ones, with their friends, people they haven't seen in a while. I've got a bunch of Christmas cards this week from people that I haven't talked to in forever. And some of these Christmas cards come with letters about all the awesome accomplishments that these people have done over the year. And, of course, I feel basically like a couch potato after reading these letters, okay? (laughs) Because these people have all gone to the Olympics, traveled the world, made $40 million. I mean, they're awesome. They're on a roll. And that's kind of why this article on Psychology Today got my attention. It's called, Are You at Risk of Facebook Envy? (laughs) And I thought it was pretty funny because we've visited about this briefly on the show before. This whole social media envy thing, it's introduced a new dynamic in our social lives, or at least it's really heightened that, that whole jealousy factor that people have always had. As humans, we have a tendency to compare ourselves to other people. And I think you've been the first to say that that ego is very, very present in the process of persuasion. And that's why I like to kind of delve into these things a little bit, because I don't know, you never get on your Facebook. I know this, right? You, you barely (laughs) know it exists. The irony of that, Kurt, is that you're cooler than I am now, (laughs) because I was talking to my niece. We were at a family Christmas party last night. She's 15 years old. And she was like, what's up? And I said, I don't know. Don't you look at Facebook? And she looks at me in pure disgust. Okay. Like Facebook. Yeah, Nobody. Teenagers. Yeah. No teenagers do that. And that's what I'm waiting for is the new Facebook. So I'll just get started with that one because there's going to be something new and different that changes. And yeah, it's interesting that teenagers keep finding something different, something different. And now that it's popular, they don't want nothing to do with it. Yes, because all their parents are on there seeing what they're up to, I think. <laughs> Well, that's why they have their own little ones they don't tell the parents about, that they're more anonymous, and that's a whole other trend in, a, in and of itself. Yeah, well, parents, I learned that these are pretty much Instagram, Twitter, Vine, uh, Snapchat. Those are all the ones they're using now, but it was uh, pretty interesting because I learned how out of style I am. Only old people use Facebook now, but they do use it for business. I mean, I have a handful of people that I'm friends with on Facebook that are constantly posting about, I did this in my business, or I've got this special going, or or whatever it is. So it's pretty interesting if you're going to take that approach to build your business on Facebook. It's also important to consider what kind of personal things that you're posting on there. Because if you're giving people, quote unquote, Facebook envy, then they're not going to want to do business with you. And so that's why I thought this was a a good article to bring up. It's talking about Facebook envy and how people are dealing with this. And there are a couple of points that the author makes on this, and I'll post a link to it in the blog. But basically six different things 
that we can apply if we're just tired of it. And I've had people on Facebook drive me nuts before, and I know many of the people listening have had the same. So, the six categories. Are you ready? Do you want to do your best drum roll? Oh, I'm just saying I'm ready. Go for it. Okay, number one way to deal with Facebook envy, don't judge your insides by other people's outsides. Duh, right? Because people on Facebook, they're only putting up the highlight reel. And nobody puts on there that they've got bad gas <laughs> or they got uh, in a fender bender today. It's always the good stuff, and we need to understand that. Part of it, too, the second thing they said is knowledge is power. you got to help your kids understand that comparison is natural, but negative comparisons and social media make this worse. You can make dozens or or hundreds of negative comparisons in just a few minutes. I mean, you think before Facebook and the Internet came along, it was really, really hard to make negative comparisons because you just didn't interact that much. But now you get flooded with this so much and you think of the negativity that can overwhelm you or, or your kids and how that makes you feel. Pretty crazy that how much it's heightened that exposure to negativity. This one, <laughs> number three, is called Time's Up, meaning put a time limit on it. <laughs> it sounds kind of sounds kind of juvenile. I've actually done this before. Sometimes I've just said, yeah. I can't stand Facebook anymore. I'm going to go off for a couple of days or do a Facebook fast like many people have called it. And that's another way that the author argues that you can uh, mitigate that Facebook envy. And, And another one is just stay off there when you're sad because they're arguing that if you're depressed or if you're in a bad mood, this amplifies it like a, a ton. Okay. And also go in with a plan, come out with a plan, right? Don't surf profiles on Facebook. You know, some people will sit there and they'll click on somebody's profile, look through all their pictures and see what they're doing over here and what they're doing over there. If you're going to get on, make it be so that you're going to contact so-and-so or contact your old friend that is only on Facebook. That's the only way that you know how to find them. Don't just sit there and wallow in everybody else's accounts and their pictures and, and all their conquests and things. And the sixth one is dealing more with kids as well. But remember that you're the primary authority figure in your child's life. They're not going to have the self-knowledge or the discipline to walk away from a situation that's fueling that kind of negativity and that kind of depression. They need a responsible person to come in and take control. And I think that that's what this article is kind of persuading people to do with their own lives, especially around Christmas, especially it being that holiday time of year when If people have something that's not going great in their life, this is probably a time of year when it really gets magnified, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And when you're in that sad, depressed state, you're looking for more things to make you more sad and depressed, it seems, for a lot of people. And Facebook could be one of those things. And and she talked about something really important, too, that human nature is we're always going to compare our weaknesses to other people's strengths. We're going to always post our top 10% of the day while you are... Well, you're comparing it to your bottom 10% of your day. And that's important for people to understand is that it's human nature to do that. Just like those Christmas letters you get, it's the best of the best of the best for the last 12 months. And you think that's their whole life. They didn't give you the 99% or the 90% that was terrible, that went rotten, that didn't work out. But you think their life is perfect. And that's what we focus on. And it happens all the time on Facebook. Yeah. And all other kinds of social media. It's just the key is, is to realize that, yeah, you're just getting the best of the best and and follow those uh, six points. And if it's something you struggle with, you know, the article might be a good reference point for you. Some of you are going, come on, I'm never on there. Move on already. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's fine. I mean, it's, it's not just an application to Facebook. It's an application to our whole social dynamic because it really does. Social media just makes you more of what you already are socially. Right? If you're insecure and you're a gossip, that's what social media is going to make you more of. If you're an antisocial recluse, it's going to magnify the fact that that's what you are. So I thought that might be something helpful when you're getting all those uh, cheesy letters in the mail that are going to continue coming for about the next week or so. So everybody hunker down. They're coming, and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. Now, we do have something for you content-wise today that might at least make this whole holiday season more entertaining i'm not implying that it's that it's not entertaining we've just kind of been going off about some of the irritants of the holiday season but there's tons of ads everywhere car dealers furniture dealers 
toys, clothes, department stores, grocery, they've all got an angle that they're working during the holiday season here. And when we're talking about advertising, when we're talking about that angle of persuasion, one of my favorite things to consider, we mentioned this last week, is something that you, Kurt, call the law of verbal packaging and the, the kinds of words that we use and when we use them. And I like this part of persuasion because it's a way to very quickly move the needle, very quickly see results in your persuasion skills. Because swapping out a few words or leaving out or adding some particular words can really crank up the power of your message, can it not? Absolutely. Verbal packages is one of those things we can fix right away that we can see results right away, especially in marketing. You can adjust a few words and see a 20% increase in response. And most people don't realize that every word they use, whether it's in an email, a face-to-face -face presentation, over the phone, leaving a voicemail, every word we use is going to attract or repel the person that you're talking to. Every word you use is going to trigger a different emotional response. And you have to realize there's power in words to trigger emotions, to bring people towards your message, to repel people away from your message. And people don't even think about words they use make a huge difference, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in negotiation, whether it's just in, in your relationships. Yeah, they're, they're everywhere. I had a college professor. This was a philosophy class. And he was talking about how your ability to feel emotion and understand and process it starts at such an early age because your whole mental framework is made up of words. Like, I think it's funny if anybody out there speaks more than one language, you know that a lot of times in one language, there might not be a direct translation for that word in the other language. You might have to talk around that word for a couple of sentences to adequately express what it means. Yet in that first language, you can say it in one word. So our whole verbal framework is made up that way. And a lot of times associations and past experiences we've had with words and, and experiencing them dictate how we're going to feel about what is said. And so it's extremely powerful and, and something that we really have to pay attention to. And the whole sciences are, are devoted to it. And you could look at education level, it could be cultural, it could be past experiences. For example, couples that are trying to name their children that's a hard time. You think it'd be pretty easy. Well, let's name it Fred. And then the wife says, well, I knew a moron. His name was Fred, right? We have <laughs> Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then she's all, how about, uh, better be careful here. How about Elmer? Well, I do want Elmer. And, and the reason it's so hard is every time just the word, just a name triggers emotional responses in people that every other word you're using is doing the same thing. So it could be a name. It could be a word. And I like what Mark Twain said. He said the difference between the right word and the wrong word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. Yeah, well, Kurt's using Elmer as an example because clearly nobody under the age of 80 years old is named <laughs> Elmer. Oh, and, careful, careful. And they can't even pick up a podcast. Oh, I predict some mail on that one. <laughs> I don't think they're going to know how to do it. I'm willing to take my chances. Okay. <laughs> if your name's Elmer and you're over 80 years old and you know how to work email, we deserve to hear from you. <laughs> Maximize your influence at gmail.com. Bring it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going through that. I mean, my wife, she's a ticking time bomb. You know, we're going to have a baby here in the next two and a half weeks. It's anybody's guess as to when, but it's going to happen. And so we think we've got the name thing nailed down, but... That exact thing has happened. She says, what about this? And on half of them, I'm like, no, not happening. But I like it. I'm like, no. I knew a guy in eighth grade that was an idiot. And I just can't have my kid walking around with that name because I'm just going to see an idiot the whole time. And that's that association trigger. And that's why marketers sending emails, if you can look at every word, it makes a huge difference. Just And my favorite example is the airlines. They know how to package every word they use. And so... Listeners, when you get on the airlines the next time, you listen to that video presentation and you watch how they package every single word because they don't want people to panic. One of my favorite ones is when they say, in the event of a water landing. Hello? Right? It's not when the plane hits the water and the wings rip off. It's in the event of a water landing. Or yep. even worse, in case of cabin depressurization. People don't realize what that really means is that you're at 37,000 feet and there happens to be a large hole in the plane sucking everybody out. But in the event of cabin depressurization is how they package it. You reach for the barf bag. It says, for motion discomfort. There's no bathrooms. There's lavatories. They don't clean a plane. They refresh it. Plane's never late. It's delayed. 
I've flown millions of miles, and they've never lost my luggage. It's been misplaced. And the best one is the pilot will never come on and say, oh, ladies and gentlemen, the plane is broke. It's mechanical difficulties. <laughs> well, it's worn off a little bit recently, but Southwest Airlines grew so quickly. I'm not underestimating their low fares that aren't so low anymore, but that contributed a lot to it. But people liked it because... They had that culture of having more fun, the flight attendants and how they would make the announcements and things. And it wasn't so corporate and so uh, litigious in how they were doing it, trying to prevent litigation. And, and people like that. They still have these procedures that they just have to go through. And that's why they've chosen this verbal packaging. You know, I was on a flight the other day from Phoenix to Albuquerque. And, of course, they took us through what to do in the event of a water landing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm like, well, the pilot's going to gonna fall asleep and turn right for four hours. <laughs> that might make a difference. Delta's done that too. A little humor and it adds a little spice. They have the things that they have to do. There's the things that they can spice up. And pilots go to verbal packaging or we'll call it voice training before they can even get onto the mic. In fact, we judge the pilots on their voice. We could listen to the worst pilot in the whole fleet, right? And they're like, Welcome aboard to Flight 1412 to Boston. We're like, you, we got a good pilot. This yeah, is great. Yeah. Deep voice. It's calming. The inflection's down. And what if the best pilot came on and says, hi, welcome aboard. We're going to have fun. <laughs> you know? Like, ah, even though it's the best pilot, they have the best record. We judge on voice. We judge on word. And when you're in a situation where everyone's packed into a little sardine can or whatever you want to call it and People could quickly panic, and there's a lot of fears that are going on. You have to be very careful with voice, with inflection, with verbal packaging, and word choice. Yeah, that's true. It's because in verbal packaging, too, how you start it off can really affect all of the perception. I, I remember in your book, Maximum Influence, you had a portion where you could read a series of words, and the first word in that series would dictate how the whole rest felt. I think it was something like you would say, cold, industrious, critical, practical, and determined. And if you thought about that as a person, you'd think, wow, that guy's kind of probably a jerk and doesn't have a lot of feeling to him. But if you said, this guy is warm, industrious, critical, practical, and determined, you all of a sudden think, okay, he's got a good personality, he's focused, he might be critical, but it's because he cares. It's a totally different feeling that you get from just swapping out that first word of the sentence. Yeah, great. Remember, that was a great study where only difference when they were describing a speaker that was coming was that first word, but that tainted the evaluations, just the word between cold and warm and how important it is, especially with that first word that you lead with or a headline in a marketing piece that you're using the right words. Yeah. Well, you have, too, a list of words, and, and I won't bore everybody with the details, but when I first met you, I was working on one of your uh, sales teams that you were leading, and you were listening to me on the phone one day. And to your credit, you didn't strangle me. You were very <laughs> patient. But I had just basically completely slaughtered the law of verbal packaging. I used so many of these no-no words. Uh, you call them words that repel. And there's kind of a list of those, some words that can creep into our vocabulary as persuaders that we absolutely shouldn't use. And there are certain words that we should replace them with. Do you, uh, you feel like, I'm, I'm kind of coming at you out of left field on this, but you feel like you can go over some of those with us? Yeah, you bet. I mean, it could be marketing, it could be even food choice, the way we talk about words. And let's talk about you know, persuaders and marketers, words that they use, especially big companies. When someone's reading about products and they call up the company, says, I'm interested in XYZ product. And the receptionist says, hold on, let me transfer you to sales. <laughs> Thinking, <laughs> hello, you just created a wall and the person hasn't even talked to somebody before. Buckle up, you're going to sales. Or, hey... Let me get the contract. No, that's a terrible word. It could be agreement or paperwork. Or, but worse, sign the contract. Those are two bad words. Why not okay the paperwork? I mean, you feel the difference between sign the contract and okay the paperwork, autograph this, endorse this. And that's important to understand. It's not cancellation. It's right of rescission. It's not commission. It's fee for services. It's not how much the house costs. It's what's the investment. We don't ask for credit card. It's form of payment. We don't ask for an appointment because that's always long. It can be time to visit. You're not the most expensive. You're, you're the top of the line. You're not the cheapest. You're the most economical. I mean, we can go on and on, but all these words matter. We don't say the words like but 
that negates everything in front of it. And guys, I don't know if you've done this before. You look great tonight, dear, but okay, you'll probably find yourself <laughs> on the couch because you've discounted everything. Now, you could strategically use it, but most persuaders use words like but too much or they say if instead of when. They say could instead of can. They say all the words that maybe or hopefully or, or even worse, when you see a, a salesperson kind of look at someone and says, you wouldn't be interested, would you? You're like, hello? <laughs> let's have a little confidence, number one, and let's package those words a, bit, a little better, number two. Yeah, I, I've noticed, too, that when your customer or your prospect, when they're talking about your product or service to you and they use one of the no-no words, it's very helpful to, I just call, repackage it and send it back. Like somebody says, I noticed that you guys are the most expensive out there. And you could reply with, with that, well, we are the top of the line. That's correct. We, we, you know, and then build the value. Not say, well, yeah, we are the most expensive. We are the top of the line. So you just went through that laundry list of words. If they use the bad word, you've got to come back and kind of reframe how they're thinking about it. Because it's not a good word. You don't want your product associated with those words. That's exactly right. And if they say something like, oh, well, what's it cost? What's it cost? Well, let's talk about your possible investment here. You're changing it around. You just got to get away from those, as we were talking about, those weasel words. And I don't know if our listeners know what a, a weasel does, but a weasel sneaks into a chicken coop, finds an egg, sucks everything out of the eggs, and leaves this hollow, empty shell there. And that's a weasel word, which could be anywhere from maybe, hopefully, up to almost approximately May might, all those words that really aren't very persuasive that a lot of people tend to use. Yeah. And it does fork, especially on the numbers too. I mean, this is probably more of a different topic, but I think too, when they say up to this amount or 11.99%, I've got a, a, a property that I'm in the process of flipping right now. And we're taking out a hard money loan because we want to free up capital to buy another property. And the going rate is anywhere from 12 to 15 percent on hard money right now and i saw somebody sent me some literature on 10.99 percent and i was just thinking wow that's so great i mean it had a 10 in front of it even though it wasn't that much better than what i had been seeing my perception of it was so much better because they weaseled it the dollar amount is practically nothing and when people are using phrases like up to this much in savings or as much as xyz in savings so that's just a way to weasel you, but I'm not telling you you shouldn't be using it on your end either. <laughs> no, there are times and places where you could use it, especially if it's something that's not that beneficial to you, the way you say it, the way you do it. We can talk about verbal packaging and food, where they did study with hamburger, and they gave two groups of people the same batch of hamburger. In the first group, they said, try it out for quality. It's 25% fat. Second group, try it out for quality. It's 75% lean. And there was a huge difference, even though it was the same hamburger, on how people felt about it. Just like a nice steak restaurant. You love a good steak. You ask them, hey, what's the difference between your filet mignon and your ribeye? If they're trained, they're going to say the ribeye tends to be a little more marbled. Mm -hmm. any, any guess what that means? Well, I had a cowboy ribeye at Ruth's Chris on Friday night, and it was quite marbled and delicious, but very fatty. <laughs> it's right. It's just, they don't say it has more fat. It's just marbled. Yep, yep. <laughs> Marbling. I wonder who came up with that. <laughs> Think about how absurd that really is. <laughs> Ten points for them. That's great packaging. Yeah, every steakhouse in the history of the world thanks you. Good job. <laughs> well, good. We're probably... Well, we're going to, Homer's going to come on here in just a minute, Kurt. Any parting words on verbal packaging? Because I think we're going to need to save some of this for, for next week. Anything else you'd like to add on word choice or words we should avoid or, or maybe a couple of really powerful words that we should try to work into our presentation and into our marketing? We could spend a lot of time on verbal packaging and vocal inflection, but a couple power words that the research shows, one is fact. When you can say the facts are, the facts show, the facts remain, that's a power word. Probably the biggest power word that we've seen in our research is the word because. You know, Elaine Langer, she does studies with words and word choice, and she does this a lot for lawyers who go to court because every word matters in court. In fact, they go to court to decide before the even case even gets it, decide, okay, we can use fetus or unborn child because it matters in the outcome. But one of our interesting studies was 
she went to the library at Harvard. That's where she teaches. And she wanted to cut in line, and she wanted to test different word choices and different lines to see which one pulled the best. What she was the whole... line for? Was it wasn't it a copier or something? Yeah, it was a line for photocopiers. And there was, she waits about there's four or five people in line, and she'd attempt to cut. So the first time around, she says, "Hey, excuse me, may I cut in line? I'm in a rush." And about sixty percent let let her in, which was pretty good. Second time around, the phrase she tries it says, "Excuse me, may I cut in line? Because I'm in a rush." So reality is she only added one word, yeah. the power word, because it went from 60% to 94%. Wow. A huge jump. And here's where it gets fun and interesting. The third time around, she says, excuse me, may I cut in line because I need to make some copies. Well, <laughs> duh. Why else would she be there? It only dropped one point to 93%, which wasn't even statistically significant. And the reason this is so powerful and works so well is that it's a subconscious trigger word. We hear because we might automatically think you're going to give us a valid reason. And even when it's not a valid reason, it still works because we make decisions so quickly. Because I'm sure a few of those students are like, oh, wait, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> but they had already said yes, and she was already making copies, and that could be a power word. And so there's a series of words that you can use and we can talk about that makes a huge difference. Bottom line here, every word you use will either attract or repel the people that you are trying to persuade and influence. That's pretty cool. So... The word because just kind of automatically lowers somebody's guard. What comes after it doesn't even necessarily have to make a lot of sense, but because kind of gives the brain permission of, hey, this person must be credible. They have a reason. They used the word because. That's exactly right. And that's a power word that anybody can start using right away. That's when my daughter gets mad at me. Why do I have to do this? Because. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different when the frontal lobe's not developed, but that's a whole other uh, lesson. Oh, uh, you're such a nerd. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I hear him. Homer is incoming, Kurt. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, there it is. Homer and the blunder. Homer and the blunder. And you have got it this week. What do we have? So I mentioned earlier I was in San Diego, beautiful place. I'm originally from California, and I was staying at the Marriott Marquis and Yacht Club. Ooh, right you there like in that, the water. yeah. Yeah, I was on 22nd floor in the corner overlooking the whole, I guess it would Bay and Coronado and all the yachts. Now, you know me, Steve. I don't care much about cars, but we want to talk about boats and yachts. You're on board. Giddy up. No pun so intended. Was, exactly. So I was kind of picking out the yachts that I wanted and uh, – in taking a look at and it kind of triggered a blunder that happened to me I was a few years ago I was in a Cancun at a hotel and yacht club and of course there they all try to sell you their timeshares that's the big thing timeshare 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 and this particular place had a cool timeshare that included part ownership in a yacht now as you know yachts are pricey or probably a good yacht's 20 30 million dollars at least the ones that I like looking at and they're offering part ownership because, you know, timeshare, whatever, I'm not going to do it. But wait a minute, part ownership, a yacht? And they were walking me through, and it was in this big yacht. I was getting excited. And they were just almost in data dump mode a little too much. I said, well, when I take it out, you know, what are the parameters? Can I just drive it around and do this? Can I do it all on my own? And they're like, oh, no, we provide your own captain and your own crew. You don't have to worry about it all. You don't even get to drive because they're going to take care of everything. Which was their standard response, but guess what that did to me? You probably weren't super down with that, from now, what I know. Done, checked out, I'm out of there, because they assumed that's the answer that I wanted. The answer is no, I want to take it out, I want to get my captain's license, I want to be in control, I want to drive this thing, and they just shot me down, because they assumed... They prejudge that's what I want. Yeah. And we know in persuasion, prejudging is huge. It complains all the time, especially in uh, car sales where there's a man and a woman and the person focuses on the man and they don't realize that maybe the woman has all the money. The woman has right. more to say in the decision than they think. We prejudge. It sucks the energy out of the presentation. It offends the person. And just like I did, I walked, wasn't interested. They had me till they said that because they assumed they prejudged without coming back. Do you want to drive the boat? Just answer a simple question to find out where I rank versus assuming they knew what I wanted to hear. Oh, so much is accomplished by just asking a couple of questions. And it's that simple. And great persuaders ask three times more questions. And the reality is you ask the right questions. They'll tell you everything you need to persuade them. And 
it's much easier because most people are complaining that you're talking three times too much. You're vomiting. You're over-persuading. You're just doing this versus, hey, what's the most important thing about having a yacht? What's the most important thing about this car? Whatever it is, we can find out exactly what they want. We can dig deeper with questions. It saves us time. We offend fewer people. We make more money, and everyone's happier. Yep. Agreed. It's that subconscious box that we get to check off as somebody who's being persuaded of. This person listened to me. I'm satisfied. Their recommendations are going to carry so much more weight now because I believe that they understand my problem. And the pitfall is, is these people have no idea the people they're offending. They just thought, well, they're stupid or they never want it. And I, no, I was one of your best customers until you did this, this, and this. And most of us don't usually come back and say, let me tell you why you blew your presentation and why you blew that sale. No, no, we just whine about it on our podcast. That's right. Hold on to that. You'll hear about it later because you are Homer Simpson's blunder of the day. Nope. Yep, yep. (laughs) Busted. Thanks for sharing that blunder, Kurt. That's pretty much all we've got to cover today, everybody. We will catch you again next week on another episode of Maximize Your Influence. We're going to have more verbal packaging, more blunders, and more subpar holiday advice for you like we did today. (laughs) Kurt, anything you want to add before we hang it up? Yes, I do. When we go back to prejudging, I know you might be right most of the time, but you have to realize that when you prejudge somebody, when you assume something about someone, it takes the energy out of your presentation. You're not going to persuade them anyway. And realize everybody you talk to can do business with you or know somebody that can give them your heart and soul give them your best presentation no matter what don't prejudge and you'll see a big difference in your ability to captivate and influence there you have it thanks everybody and we will catch you on another episode next week see you next time